As a lerp, you, you're very quiet. And that is because it's your survival. And you just, as soon as you land on the, uh, on the ground and you make contact, you get out of there and, you, and like I say, you just, you whisper most of the time. And you take one step at a time. You don't you try not to step on any branches or anything because they make racket. Um, and let's say we set up for the night or something. Or, and and uh, when you hear all kinds of racket around there, I mean the birds and um, water buffalo might be bellering or uh, monkeys chattering. And when they're chattering and everything making normal noise, it's usually it's a sign everything's okay. But when everything gets quiet, monkeys aren't making any noise, birds aren't making, that's when you get a little nervous. And you actually de develop kind of a sixth sense. You know when there's Vietnamese around. You just know it. It's something in the air. Maybe it's because of like birds or whatever. You, you actually develop a sixth sense. And and when you do, when you know they're around, you're constantly alert, very much alert. And but then you know when everything comes back to normal, you sit back and you kind of relax. Now I remember the first. Oh, six weeks here in Vietnam. It's the most dangerous time. The first six and the last six weeks of that year. And uh, you're just so nervous and you're just scared. and You're just a pup, man. You're only 18, 19 years old, you know. You should be out chasing women, not chasing Vietnamese. And uh, so the first, like I said, the first six weeks, and, you, and then after a while, you get so tired of being nervous, you quit being nervous. And by then, you've kind of developed that sixth sense. You know when they're around. You know when to relax and when to be on alert. And uh, you listen to your gut. And uh, it got me through. Got me through. Yeah. When you guys get into firefights and these really, you know, intense events uh is it the same thing where you kind of get used to that or is it always uh when you're in a firefight the strange thing about a firefight during the time you're in the firefight you're really not that nervous you you've got a job to do and you do it the best you can it's when it's over all the shooting stopped and your mind starts doing tricks with you is it, are they circling around us uh, it could have been, that bullet could have been three inches over and you were then dead or at least shot in the arm or something. Uh, it's usually after the firefight is when you really comes down in, and that'll last for some, several days. But usually during the time of the firefight, it's just so much going on and you're so focused, you're really not that nervous. It's kind of a, kind of a strange phenomenon. And you're working in such small teams, these four-man teams. Are you guys taking casualties very often out there? No, not very often. Occasionally, yes. Um, like I said, we our whole objective is to be as quiet as we can, not to get caught, and uh, just monitor what's going on. And then we call in, uh, we might call in airstrikes, uh, which reminds me of one time. Um, we had been monitoring this trail for several, we were down lower than the trail, and the trail is right alongside of a hill, right? And we were down in, in a low area, and there's rocks and trees and super tall elephant grass, and elephant grass is, I don't know, six, seven feet high. We could see the trail pretty good, but they couldn't see us. And, uh, well, we'd seen these Vietnamese come down this trail, and of course we monitor. And the team leader, he, when, when the Vietnamese is over here, he'd call an airstrike over here. And when they passed us over here, they'd call them over there. Well, we'd done this for several days, and the Vietnamese started thinking, over here and over, somebody must be in the middle somewhere, because they're never calling an airstrike in the middle. So. <laughs> So they turned around and came down and they come right down towards the middle and there was, oh man, there must have been 30 of them. 
heading right direction for us. So, oh, Jesus, this is not good. And there was only, I think, four of us at the time. And uh, the guy behind me, he started snoring. <laughs> he went to sleep. And he was behind a rock, he started snoring. I said, shut up. <laughs> he went, <laughs> just snoring up. So, oh my God. And these, and these Vietnamese come down there. And uh, they figure, oh, these, these guys are dead asleep. We're going to catch them. And they're, they liked the idea of catching a, a lerp. They didn't want to kill us so much. They wanted to catch us and take us back to Hanoi. Because we were worth $1,500 a piece on our head. And at that time, 1500 bu bucks could buy you a pretty nice little tractor for the whole family. So that was their objective, was catch one of us, or more, take us back to Hanoi. And uh, this guy, he was just snoring up a storm. I'm like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> and uh, finally, all hell broke loose and we fired and they fired and oh man, it was a mess. And, uh, but we got out of there. Uh, they didn't. Uh, I think we killed. I don't remember how many we killed, but anyway. Um, so we, after the firefight, uh, we backed off, and what was left of them, they went down the trail, and that was the end of that. That could have been really bad. <laughs> that guy snoring. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Yeah, if he hadn't been snoring, he probably not ever, never would have came down there, but somebody had heard that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that could have been bad. But, yeah, we got out of that all right. One of the guys got wounded, but um, that was it. But, yeah. when, is it difficult to, to fire at the enemy, or are you so well trained that you're just kind of, you go into a certain mode and you're just, you do your job? Generally, I had... When I first got over there, I had an M16, which is a pretty good sight rifle. And then after you've been there a little time, you got an AR-15 if you wanted it, and which fires the same round and exactly as an M16, only it's shorter. as a sliding stock, which is really nice because you can hold it like this, and move the brush out of the way like that. And generally, the Vietnamese, uh, when you get in contact, they're usually not more than maybe 7,500 feet away. So you don't have to aim like this unless you're in a ambush or something like that. Usually because you got them right here, you can just shoot in that direction and you're going to hit them. Uh, but like if it's an ambush, then of course that's a different story. But... Uh, we did that a few times, but uh, yeah, and then that's like the AR-15 was such a good rifle because M16, it was so long and it, that sucker got heavy after a while holding like this all the time. The AR-15 kind of back over like this and you could scrunch it down and that was a good rifle. Yeah. Well, yeah, speaking of your equipment, what did you guys... Are you see pictures of the long range patrol guys and you see like tiger camo and stuff like what, how is your equipment different than like the, an average grunt? Um, well, our equipment was you, we carry usually less weight than the average grunt. They would, oh man, those guys would be carrying close to a hundred pounds in a pack. Well, we usually went out four or six days. So we just have enough food for four to six days. And uh, so our packs weren't near as heavy, but we still had grenades around here. and ammo and everything uh, our our uh, we probably carried those uh, 60 65 pounds I suppose and average grunt was pretty close to 100 pounds I'm thinking and oh man that's a lot of weight going up them down up and down those mountains like I was in Pleiku and that was the Central Highlands and there was some pretty tall mountains up there yeah um, yeah uh, like I said, our weight wasn't near as bad as the uh, as the grunts, but uh, and our our we had special rations called lerp rations, and uh, what they were, 
they were in little bags and dehydrated food. It might be spaghetti or chili or anything, and all you had to do is pour in hot water and mix it around, and it was a lot better than sea rations. All the sea rations were horrid. Now, after saying that, if you mix the sea rations with the lurp rations, that wasn't too bad. But just plain sea rations, I mean, God. They had sea rations, I remember, some of the stuff was from World War II. And we're talking about, uh, you know, the late 40s, and this, in Vietnam, it was 68. So we're talking about uh, quite a few years, and some of that stuff was pretty old. And usually, but very seldom did we have to use sea rations. Everything was lure rations because we wanted to keep as light as possible so we could travel fast, you know. Uh, if it looked like we were going to get, get in contact, we were supposed to back off. Now, that's the way it was the first six months. That's the way as a, a reconnaissance, you know. You weren't supposed to get in contact. Then after about six, eight months I've been there, they decided, well, we're going to make them hunter-killer missions. And then they, like what we usually went out in four-man teams, now we're going out in six-man teams with a guy with a machine gun. And we're supposed to be out there looking for um, the Vietnamese, which I did not sign up for. I signed up for reconnaissance, spying, not to go out there and hunter-killer. So I didn't like like that part of it but the hunter killer not at all as a as a regular lerp what i signed up for as reconnaissance that was that was pretty good you know i, I imagine those hunter killer missions were much more intense because yeah, absolutely absolutely yeah they were a lot more intense and, and they changed the objective on us okay you and I, you got six men team versus 30 or 40 vietnamese that's not very good odds oh you guys can get in there and get out Mm, yeah, right. Yeah. But then, uh, then they gradually went just back to re reconnaissance after that, you know. Yeah. But, you did, know. did any of those operations kind of go sideways where you did engage in a large force and all of a sudden went, uh oh, we're in a bad, we're in a tight spot? Or Yeah. Um, we got in one time, it was four of us and s about 30 of them. And, uh, it was just starting to get dark, if I remember rightly. And well, they had a firefight and everything. It was starting to get dark to the point they couldn't see us. We were in the jungle and we kept as quiet as we possibly could. And uh, we had claymores, you know what claymores are? Uh, we had them out. And uh, in the line, you usually you put a claymore out, go out this way, go out that way. But it's a lerp, you zigzag that wire so it, if a Vietnamese finds that claymore, he'll try to follow it in and know exactly where you're at. But if it zigzags like this, he don't know where you're at. And uh, what we decided to do was, uh, like I said, there was like about 30 of them. And they, were, they had flashlights looking for us. So what we did, like I said, the... Uh, Team leader said, hey, what we're going to do, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to blow all these claymores. It's going to scare the crap out of everybody, them and us. And it makes a lot of racket. We're flattened on the ground. These guys are still standing up. They got flashlights. So as soon as after I get, get done blowing, we're going to rise and we're heading right through them. They're, everybody's going to be disillusioned. They don't know nothing. So as soon as I blow that, Gonna get up the run, everybody grab the guy in front of you, his his uh, pack, and follow us out of there. So we went right through them. And they didn't know what, where in the hell we went. And we just passed right through them and we got out of there. But uh, that was, that could have been a little hairy, but uh, yeah. But uh, that, that's the kind of stuff you learn when you're in LERPs, because you've got, you got to think a little bit differently than uh, a regular grunt. Yeah. So, yeah, saved my butt. So. Well, doing stuff like that, did you ever get hit when you were over there? Or? <laughs> Don't, I never got shot or, or uh, 
wounded. Well, I did get wounded one time. I, oh, I was uh, in my barracks. We, I, we came back after our four-day mission, and I was in the barracks, and somebody hollered, Dalkey, Glenn Campbell's on. I love Glenn Campbell. He's on the TV. Well, our little hooch for TV was, was outside in this pitch black. I come running out of there, and there's this wall locker laying on the ground, and I hit that. It scratched my leg from there to there, and I was bleeding like a sun gun, and I just took my T-shirt off. I had to watch Glenn Campbell, man. They had nice women there, a whole bunch. So I took my T-shirt off, wrapped around, and got the blood stopped, and went over and watched. But that's the only wound I had in Vietnam, so... <laughs> I come out very, very good for, for being infantry. I, I, I was lucky. Yeah, that, that's the way to get wounded, I guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just, I'm no wall locker. That's, that's how, the only wound I had. And it, well, it hurt too, but uh, that's, that's pretty mild. Yeah, pretty mild. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, when you came back to the United States, because you, you talk about how alert and how you had kind of a sixth sense in the jungle. What's that transition like, coming back and trying to be a normal person again? Well, you, you're pretty nervous when you first get back. I'll give you an example, I, I remember I was, uh, got back and uh, I was taking a shower one time and somebody threw, I had the window open, somebody threw some rocks up on a tin roof and I heard that and I dove for the floor because it sounds just like uh, somebody firing at you. But th that gives you an idea. But it, what it, it kind of scared the crap out of me. Um, when I got back out of Vietnam, I went down to Midvale. That's where I graduated high school. And they were pretty good. They're, they're, I'm a, I bet I was offered five or six jobs and they treated me real well there now here in Spokane is not the, not the case um, I'll give you an example I went over to see one of my cousins and they asked me about Vietnam I told them this and that oh Eric that that really didn't happen well, you condescending son of a bitch it did happen and uh, at the end of our conversation he said, uh, Eric, now that you're out of the army and everything, what, what are you going to do with your life? He says, well, the reason why I went in the army in the first place was so I get the GI Bill, fly airplanes, and fly helicopters. That's what I want to do. Focus on flying airplanes and flying helicopters so I can get enough money to buy a ranch, what I got now. And that was the whole thing. And my cousin looked at me and says, flying airplanes and helicopters? No, or he, you wouldn't mean make a steward. I said, Where in God's name did that come from? You know, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I wanted to go to Hawaii. I just wanted to go in the army to <laughs> to get a GI Bill to go to school. I wasn't. He's a lawyer. I wasn't. You know, I, I my father wasn't super wealthy to send me to college. Get flight training. I I want. I had to get get some money to go flight training. So what I'm saying here in Spokane. I was treated pretty crappy, uh, like, oh, you, you, you low-life scum sucking, as if I had some great, it was my fault that I was sent to Vietnam. The funny thing is, I did, I did get my draft notice, and my draft notice, they sent me a draft notice when I'd been in Vietnam for seven months. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. And they sent me my draft when I've been in Vietnam for seven months. I, I wish I would have kept that thing, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, but uh, yeah, it seemed like the more educated the people were, the more they came down on you. Um, but like I said, when I went back to Midvale, where I had been working for my board and room when I was going to high school, oh, I was treated pretty well. Yeah, and, and they offered me jobs and yeah, pat, pat on the back and well we're glad you're home we're glad you made it back and, but here in Spokane I was treated like a, a low life 
Were you uh, suffering from any form of PTSD? I know you mentioned the shower incident, but kind of long-term type. Well, for quite a while after I got out, I used to have bad dreams. Um, and uh, I remember one dream that I had that I re-upped to go in the military. Oh my God, and, that, and as a dream progresses, you stupid SOB, why did you re-up? What is the matter with you? Finally I woke up and I was sweating. And I was so happy that <laughs> that was just a bad dream. <laughs> I just, oh my God. But uh, I, I wouldn't, other than having super bad dreams, I wouldn't say I had too much. Yeah, I guys, I'm pretty fortunate to compare to a lot of those guys that were in infantry. Um, yeah. Well, when you reflect on the Vietnam War now and kind of what happened, how you guys were treated, uh, what do you think of that that whole thing? You know, I really don't think much about it. I have a lot of friends that still keep in contact with me that that were in Vietnam. We were in Nam together. Steve, for example. Uh, and then I got another friend named Steve over there in Pennsylvania, and uh, we exchanged Christmas cards all the time. But uh, and he he talked about Vietnam. I just kind of I just wanted to go to bed. I put it to bed once and for all. And uh, but you know I'll talk about it. But uh, yeah, well I'm glad. Uh, like I said, I'm one of the luckier ones. To get out of there, and that was in infantry without, well, other than my scratch with the wall locker, you know. It, uh, yeah, it could have been a lot worse, a lot worse.